200, 200 years before Jesus, we have our very first story from a fellow named Manasius. Manasius tells us there was an attack on the Jerusalem temple. The temple was looted. Somebody, we're told, stole a golden donkey head from the inner sanctum of the temple. And apparently this golden donkey head was attached to a body. Antiochus IV also finds evidence of a statue of an old man sitting on a, on a donkey. Zechariah goes into the temple, the, into the inner shrine, because Zechariah is a priest, and there's smoke all around because incense is burning and puffing out of the censer, and so it's hard to see things. But out of the mist and out of the smoke and the dim lights, he sees a anthropomorphoid being, that is a being with two arms and two legs standing upright with a donkey head. It's like a revelation to him because he never knew that the deity worshipped by his own fellow people had a jackass for a head. Seth is a legitimate Egyptian deity worshipped by Egyptians. By 200 BCE, he was viewed as the god of evil and chaos. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I have a special guest from Australia? Is that where you're in? Yes, indeed. All the way across the globe, like literally on the opposite side of the globe, southern and different, like, complete opposite. <laughs> and uh, Dr. David Litwa, who has written the book called The Evil Creator. Got to go out and check that out. It is amazing. Even if, you, if you're a history fan or you like Christian history, um, Gnosticism, it's all in there. And there's just so much extra information that you won't find not just from like Google and stuff. This is deep scholarship level stuff right here. You're in, I'm telling you, it's worth it. But um, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're, we're going to talk about is that book in particular. And um, so let's get right into it. And David Litwa. You and you early on in the book, I think it's the first chapter, you talk about a donkey deity. And um, so, you know, I when I'm reading this, I'm thinking of Tacitus in his in his histories. He writes about uh, the Jews being kicked out of Egypt. And he says that Moses told the people in the desert to not focus on the gods and to the first thing that we see that gives us salvation, that's what we're going to worship. And sure enough, on the seventh day of their uh, abandon and of their traveling in the desert, uh, a wild, or I think, I don't know if they're wild or not, but a bunch of donkeys leads them to some water, a bunch of asses. And so the, Tacitus is saying that because of this, Moses started a new cult of donkey worship, donkey deities. Is that, is, are this, is this connected to what you're talking about? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a good story, and Tacitus tells a good story. Um, Tacitus, in fact, comes at the very end, though, of a much, much longer tradition and of stories that were told hundreds of years before him. And I, I think uh, it's best to start at the beginning and just backtrack a little bit to, to get a little bit more of the context. Because Tacitus is writing in, in Rome or, or the environs um, in early second century CE. Uh, so he's, uh, he's well aware of the Christian movement and he's, he's, he's about a, a good hundred years after Jesus. But 200, 200 years before Jesus, that is around 200 BCE, uh, we have our very first story uh, from a fellow named Manasius. And Manasius tells us that there was an attack on the Jerusalem temple um, and that as a result of this attack, there the temple was looted and somebody, um, we're told, stole a golden 
donkey head from the inner sanctum of the temple. And apparently this golden donkey head was attached to a body. Wow. And so he he went in there and you're not supposed to go in there, obviously. Uh, the high priest only goes in there once a year. It's very secret. It's like a secret ritual. But he goes in there and he comes out with this head of an ass. It's gold, all gold. And he he takes this back to his own camp. And that's the very first story of that, that gives us an indication that secretly the Judeans, the ancient Judeans, are worshiping. They say that they're an iconic, which means that they are not worshiping with statues. Right. That their inner sanctum, sometimes called the Holy of Holies, is absolutely empty. Right. That's what they're claim. But lo and behold, these traditions arise in which there was secretly something in there. And what was taken was the head of a donkey. And that's a very early story. Yeah, that is. That's before Christianity. Like you said, 200 BC, right? 200 years before Jesus himself, 250 years before Christianity. And this, these stories continued. Um, Posidonius, who's writing around 70 BCE, uh, Apollonius Molon, uh, writing about the same time. They're both from the island of Rhodes. They make the claim that, um, like that Antiochus, the fourth also finds and, and Antiochus, just so that your 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 viewers know, is the most famous attacker of the Jerusalem Temple. He's the cause of the Maccabean literature. Mm -hmm. um, he takes over the temple and sets up what's called the abomination of desolation. But he goes in to the inner sanctum and he also finds evidence of donkey worship this time the story is a bit different that actually there's an old man a statue of an old man sitting on a, on a donkey that's interesting and we, we don't know who the who the old man represents i it could be moses could be could be Yahweh. the messiah right could be the messiah because <laughs> well, i mean in the, I mean, that's, a, that's, an, that's a reading influence maybe by Matthew. But yeah, I, I could actually be Yahweh um, in anthropomorphic form. Um, we don't know. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, isn't it, in the, I think, in the Talmud or something, one of those texts that says that the Messiah will come riding a donkey? Well, if it, I mean, oh, so yes, there's a there's a there's a prophecy in, in the book of Zechariah, which is much, much earlier, that is adapted in right. the Gospel of Matthew. Um, but the, the, what, what gives that interpretation legs is the Christian gospel of Matthew. It's really not, it's really not emphasized too much in other, other literature. But, um, so the question about the question about this is, uh, and, and then where does this end up? Uh, there's one more tradition that I'll, that I'll tell one more story that I'll tell. And, and this comes from a Christian document. And the, the Christians who use this document, it was called the birth of Mary. And the Christians who use this document were apparently called Fibionites. We don't know why they were also called Fibionites, but th they were called Fibionites. Um, and they had a story in which, that actually ad adapted the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, uh, because the Gospel of Matthew has a, has a tradition where Jesus is condemning the, the Judeans as his fellow Jews and says that you'll be held responsible for all the blood that was shed from Zechariah unto the present moment. And the question is, well, who's, who's the Zechariah you're referring to? Um, and when was he killed? Um, and so there, there were stories that, that arose about Zechariah being killed in the temple courts. And the only Zechariah that the Christians were familiar with is Zechariah, father of John the Baptist. And they got that from, from Luke. 
Um, at any rate, to make a long story short, they told a story that Zechariah goes into the temple, the into the inner shrine, because Zechariah is a priest, and there's smoke all around because incense is burning and puffing out of the censer, and so it's hard to see things. And Zechariah's never been in the Holy of Holies, but he goes in there and he thinks it's empty. But out of the mist and out of the smoke and the dim lights, he sees very clearly a anthropomorphoid being, that is a being with two arms and two legs standing upright with a donkey head. This is mentioned in your book, by the way, right? Exactly. <laughs> and he wants to run out to the Jews because he, he is so shocked because he interprets this being as the deity worshipped. But it's like a revelation to him because he never knew that the deity worshipped by his own fellow people was had had a jackass for a head. Wow. So he he runs out and wants to scream to the people, what are you worshiping at the top of his lungs? Unfortunately, the donkey deity temporarily seals his lips, shuts him up. And that's why he goes, he becomes um, dumb, basically. Mute. Exactly. And this is this is extra biblical text. What, what is this from exactly? So this text is from the birth of Mary, and this text doesn't survive, but this portion of it is quoted by a Christian writer uh, called Epiphanius in the late fourth century. So that's how we get to know it. Fast. So the, the question then is, how, how did these traditions arise? How did these stories, which aren't all the same, and which get a lot of traction? Because when, when Tacitus gets a hold of it, um, and when Plutarch gets a hold of it, Plutarch being a very famous Greek writer, Tacitus being a very famous Roman writer. And a so high know, priest, Plutarch, high we, priest of Delphi. Exactly. And so we know that the story has legs. In other words, it's being spread. It's well known that the Jews secretly worship a being with the head of an ass and that Yahweh's secret identity is that he's an ass god. It's sort of like a, a conspiracy. Um, and, and, and then the question is, how did this conspiracy about the Judean deity actually arise? And for that, you need to go all the way back to Egypt, because the origins of the ass deity are Egyptian. And the, the ass deity par excellence is Set, the Egyptian god set or seth if you prefer it's s-e-t-h and this is a deity um who appears on the on the on the book itself <laughs> and he's actually the evil i guess you will evil god the opposing the adversary of osiris and horus and isis and Egyptian exactly god. right so and this is what tacitus was talking about when tacitus was saying that they worship the opposite of what people in Egypt do because of they were so mad about being kicked out of Egypt that they're like, we're not going to worship those gods anymore because they they uh, they don't like us anyway. So we're just going to go with the opposite, which is brings you to Seth. Well, yes and no. I, so Seth is a legitimate Egyptian deity worshipped by Egyptians, but by by 200 BCE he was viewed as the god of evil and chaos. So in a sense, he he sort of plays the role of a devil figure, but he's not really he's not really the devil for the Egyptians. The Egyptians don't have a devil. They simply have a god, and they also worship this god who is also evil. He is associated okay. who's he's associated with foreigners. He's always been associated with foreigners long before anything that, you know, long before the Bible was ever written. And so the God of the ancient Hebrews, the God that they chose for themselves was this evil God of chaos, who is a legitimate Egyptian deity, who does seem to have the head of an unrecognized animal 
which was identified by the Greeks and Romans as a jackass. Wow. That's so fascinating. And I want to talk about set, but I, it's going to relate to my second question. Um, sure. But I want to touch on something that Jesus actually says when he says that you're, it's in John, I believe, where he tells the Jews something really strange and it's really hard to understand. It's even crazier in, in the Greek version. I think you know the Greek version. And he says that your father is the devil. What can you can you clarify what he, what that means, or if this ties into it, what we're talking about? Well, that's chapter two of the book, and uh, I'll just say a brief word about that. Um, the Greek is ambiguous, um, it, so the the Greek is "humes uh, ektu patru tu diavalu," which could be translated as it is traditionally in all English versions as you Judean people, who are basically fictional characters, but you Judean people are from your father, the devil. Now that's almost universally taken, but it could also be translated, you are from the father of the devil. Which is, which changes the context a little bit. Which raises the question, who is the father of the devil? Especially because the only God that the Jews worship is Yahweh. So the evident reference to the father of the devil is Yahweh himself. And that's wow. a game changer. Well, you mentioned something about Set. You said that he was known, known to be chaos. And the demiurge in Greek and like Plato's text is also chaos, I guess they would they call it chaos or whatever. And first, chaos ruled. I don't know if that's Saturn is the same thing. Saturn, that's what I'm asking. Is Set the same thing? It, not the same thing, but equivalent sort of of Saturn, of Kronos, the chaos at the beginning? Like Hesiod, I think, I think it's Hesiod, if I'm not mistaken says in the beginning chaos ruled um it is it is hesiod um uh, hesiod identifies four different entities um who were original one of them being chaos which in greek uh, just simply means uh, a chasm or an abyss in an, an empty empty space wow um it's not said that chaos rules, but it is said that four original entities are sort of primeval and originate and that they had no other origin. So chaos that is this huge empty space is original to the universe. It didn't need to be created. It just just is. It Emptiness is. simply is. Um, to get to your other question about Set and Kronos, uh, there is no no one, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, there's no one who's identifying Set and Kronos. But the commonality between them is such that Kronos is viewed as the closest thing that the Greeks have to uh, a god who severely misbehaves because Kronos, as you know, eats, eats his children. own children. Right. Um, and yeah, that's and, and generally that, not perceived as good. No, and it, it's also interesting that Set and Saturn sort of sound like, I don't know if they are, I'm not going to be wrong, Sounds like cognates. Sounds like it, but I could be completely wrong. Set Saturn. You know what I'm saying? Like it almost makes you wonder. And if I'm not mistaken, there is a Egyptian in the Book of the Dead. There's a ver something in there. I, I could like I had these. I have all these like uh, these copies that are not. They're 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 amateur copies. They're translations or Oxford, whatever. But it's the one I have for the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It says that his name is Satanu. S A T A N U, Satanu. And it sounds like Satan, doesn't it? 
I don't know if that's even real or if that's like a mistranslation in my translation because I'm reading it in English. I don't know if you know about that, but it sounds really like this is the, the earliest form of Satan in Egypt. Well, the linguistic stuff, you'll have to talk to an Egyptologist. Sure. Uh, e e Egypt, the Egyptian language did evolve over time. So the Book of the Dead, my goodness, is, I mean, thousands of oh, years man. older even than the Bible. So, sure. <laughs> uh, but, but you are talking about two different linguistic fields. So the, the Egyptian language is, is a whole different ball of, of wax than sure. the Hebrew and Semitic languages. Um, so Satan is in Hebrew, Set is Egyptian. Whether they go back to something original, I don't know, and I couldn't say. Um, that's not my. That's not my field. Yeah. No, I, fair, fair enough. <laughs> I figured I'd ask. It's, it's a mystery to me. It's and like like I like you said. I, I don't think there's anyone out there that's making that claim. It's something I just noticed. And um, you know, the last thing I want to ask you is about Marcion. This is the big chunk. The, the rest of the book, pretty much, he's sort of the guy. You know what I mean? And he uh, he's this interesting character in the second century who is selling his version of Christianity to the Romans and they don't want it. So, but he ends up going back to Asia minor and it becomes pretty popular over there for whatever reason. Um, I guess my question is, is Marcy. Okay. This is my question. Is Marcion's version of Christianity. Is there, is there, is there a Jewish version of Gnosticism that predates Marcion? Did, like, is he getting this from somewhere before Christianity even took place? Is this older than we think or no? Well, it's a very complex question, and I'll try to parse it out as best I can. Sure. First of all, about Marcion, there's a lot of superficial knowledge about Marcion available on the Internet, and I would, yeah, I'd really encourage your listeners to to really do an in-depth deep dive into into Marcion um, and because there the scholarly literature is is growing and new findings are being made and so on and so forth basically just two slight corrections there so Marcion had tremendous success in Rome um, this language about him being excommunicated by Roman church leaders is all anachronistic Marcion didn't agree with competing Roman church leaders, and he started his own church of his own accord. No one in 144, which is what we when we think this happened, had the power to excommunicate someone. And it's an anachronistic to say as if, you know, there was some kind of pope who could excommunicate you in Rome. There wasn't. The, it just didn't exist. And other churches, you know, might want to practice exclusionary, you know, things. But the fact is, Marcin left of his own accord, established his own institution, established his own house churches, and was very successful in Rome, and not just Asia Minor, but pretty much everywhere within uh, 50 years of Marcin's death. That includes Africa, Syria, lands east of Syria, it includes Egypt. Marcion had a very famous disciple called Apelles, who did a lot of work in Egypt. So Marcion's movement is universal. And uh, that's one thing to note about him. It wasn't, I mean, a lot of people talk about early Christian history as if it's a popularity contest or it's a horse race. And that's true. If, if you were in the mid second century, you might think, that Marcion was winning. <laughs> wow. so, um, but to get to your main question, um, I think what my book shows, well, just a little bit of background. So a pre-Christian Gnosticism or a Jewish Gnosticism was a popular theory in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and is upheld by some today, but it's waning. And 
I think it's, I think it's not accurate. Um, I, I think that there's, there's no, not enough evidence in the sources to indicate any pre-Christian Jewish Gnosticism. Even the disasters that the Jews faced are all, by which I mean the, the war with Rome in, in 66 and the uh, rebellion in 115 and the second war with Rome in 135, all of this is after Christianity. And when you look at Jewish literature, even then the Jews aren't rejecting their deity. They are finding a way to answer why it's still legitimate to worship Yahweh, even though he seems to have abandoned his people utterly. The Jews are extremely faithful to yeah. their God. So if there's any movement which would support a um, a different attitude toward, toward the Judean deity, that was Christianity itself. Sure. And what my book shows is that Christianity is really the origin of Gnostic thought, but they were depending on resources that had been prepared hundreds of years before them from Egypt. Makes sense. And so it's Egypt that is the wellspring. And because it's Egypt who provides this myth, this story about Yahweh being an evil God identified with Set. And using the resources from that very ancient myth, Christians then develop a mythology in which Yahweh, a.k.a. Yaldabaoth, is an evil deity who is also um, portrayed occasionally with animal heads and occasionally with a donkey head. So, and, and where else do you find those type of deities with anim like anthropomorphic animal heads, deities? Egypt. You got Horus, the falcon head god. You got... It's that was that just wasn't you got alligator head gods, you got dogs head gods. So it's not that crazy. To, like that's pretty. I think it's pretty obvious to me that that's where it come from. Exactly. Now the, there is a for Marcion there is a contribution of Judaism because he's reading Jewish texts and like many atheists today going through the so-called Old Testament, he's amazed by what he finds because he's probably, uh, I think, almost surely of Gentile origin, who we don't know when he was converted to Christianity, but we have no reason to think that he was a cradle Christian, so to speak, that he was a Christian from birth. So at, at some point he came into the movement, he encountered the Hebrew Bible, having never read it before, but he sat down to study it, like many today can do, and was just horrified by what he found. So in a sense, the Hebrew scriptures influenced his negative reading of the Judean deity because he saw the Judean deity doing all these nasty things among them. And just in case anyone's wondering what we're talking about, it's, for example, you got Elijah being called Baldy and he's sending down lightning to kill kids because kids, a little a couple, six-year-old, 10-year-old kids call them Baldy. Or, she bears. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what it was. She. Not, I don't know why I said lightning. I'm thinking of a uh, different part of the Bible. Anyways. But yeah, that's what he, you you see that and you're like, that doesn't sound like a loving God that would kill kids because they call his prophet a baldy. Or a better example, I think, is the Egyptian example when God Himself hardens Pharaoh's heart and then kills all the firstborns because of what he did to harden because of him hardening pharaoh's heart it's like whoa it's he he did that like so if you're a marcion in the second century and you're reading that you're probably saying this is not this does not seem like the loving god of jesus which is that's the whole entire gist of the gnostic thought the demiurge is yeah this god is out there he's creating everything but he's just not the the good one there's got to be another one out there 
you go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's basically it, and and it's a philosophically informed theology, which I, which I think many might even today implicitly agree with, and, and according to that philosophy, is if God does what is evil, then he's not God, because God is and can only do good. So if you have a, a literature in which portrays gods and deities doing bad things, well, guess what? That's not the true God and the true deity. And if you are a believer, there's something above that. And thankfully for Marcion, or from his perspective, Jesus was the one who revealed the God above the false God. It's fascinating. And you, it makes you wonder if Marcion reading the Stoics, like Epicurus was talking about, if he, if he can prevent evil, but doesn't, then is he, maybe he's not omnipotent, but if he can, then he's malevolent. And if he's not any of those things, then he, why I call him God, you got to think maybe that's influencing him when he's reading through the, the uh, Hebrew Bible to sort of make his judgment, if that makes sense. Sure, but it probably not Epicurean thought as much as Platonic thought, because um, for Epicureans, the gods really don't care about humanity and are in the interstitial spaces. Uh, but for Platonists, God, including the Platonist Demiurge, is highly involved with creation, just like the Christian God. Uh, the difference being that for Plato, uh, carrying through with his principle that God only does good, the Demiurge oh, is uh, an entirely good being. And the Demiurge, just so that your listeners aren't confused, the Demiurge is just the Greek word meaning creator. So it, when you speak of creator and Demiurge, that's the same, right. same thing. This is what Plato was writing about in his Timaeus. And, exactly. and the, uh, so and now it just, again, it popped in my head is the reason the whole entire reason why I'm bringing up this whole proto uh you know this proto christian gnosticism I guess you would say is you know Philo I think is a good example of a neoplatonist Jew, Jew who's greek speaking who's looking around and picking up taking out parts from uh, from from Plato and he's reading about the he's writing about all these other greek philosophers and Pythagoras and put, trying to roll it all into one and try to make it make sense of everything and it almost makes you wonder if people like that got the ball rolling for Christianity and Gnosticism to actually thrive. And like this, you know, that makes sense. Yeah, I've got an article, hopefully it will be published soon on Philo and, and Gnostic thought. Um, oh, I can't wait for that. And yeah, I, I think the main thing to, to note there is, yeah, Gnostics are are Christians who don't have any love or loyalty for the Judean deity. So they don't grow up loving, loving Yahweh. And so they don't feel any problem viewing him as a local deity. Sort of like if you were to go to an African village and they were to tell you about their own local creator deity, you'd be like, that's nice. Um, <laughs> and good for you. Um, right. You you didn't grow up with that, so you you don't have any. If that deity does something evil, you have no problem with saying that that deity is evil, or that he doesn't exist, or or whatever. Um, so when the Christians inherit the Judean scriptures, some of them view the the Judean scriptures as their own, but some of them don't. And Marcion apparently did not. So. Again, the superficial knowledge of Marcion is that he rejected the Old Testament. Well, that doesn't make any sense because he's one of the best students of the Old Testament. So in that sense, he's not rejecting it. He's studying it. But in order to reject something, it has to be established. And the fact is, in the early second century, the Judean scriptures aren't necessarily established as Christian scriptures, at least not everywhere. That's a sort of dogma that we hear, but and to my mind, it's not it's not universally the case. Um, so Gentiles who become Christians, many of them were completely unfamiliar with the Judean scriptures, and they went to Christian assemblies where 
the letters of Paul were written, uh, were the letters of Paul were read, or maybe one gospel was read, and there wasn't a whole lot of interaction with the Judean scriptures. Uh, and that's just the case. Um, they, 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 were, they weren't uh, accorded absolute value. So there's nothing to reject there if they aren't already considered scripture. Now, now this makes me wonder about these, the Greek translation of the Bible, which is the Septuagint in the second, I guess, the second or third century BC in Egypt. Um, do you think that that happening, that actually being translated? And also, is it true that the Roman Empire was 10% Jewish? I've heard this before. I'm not sure if it's true or not. The 10% of the yeah, Roman that, Empire was Jewish, as people say. That sounds a bit high to me, but yeah. there, there's no demi, there's no demographics um, okay, yeah. that, are, that are reliable. Yeah, um, that's, that's what I was thinking, too. Like, how do you know that? Especially that you have to understand that right around the time of Jesus, or in the immediate aftermath, Jews undergo a huge decimation in their population, um, such that after two wars, three wars between 66 and 135. Rough time for them. There is, it, after 135, Jews are banned from Judea. Wow. They almost a thousand of their villages are destroyed. They're systematically killed. There's been a genocide in Alexandria around 117. So if there was ever a, a time for low Jewish population, it would be right around 135, where Jerusalem itself was established as a Hellenic city where Jews weren't even allowed to enter. And they renamed it, didn't they? Yes, it was called Aelia Capitolina. A lot of people, lot of people don't even realize that. Is that Jerusalem was just gone for a while. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, there was virtually no Jewish activity in Jerusalem between about 135 and uh, the time of Constantine, which is 335. So a, a good 200 years. There's virtually no Jewish presence there at all whatsoever. So right around the time where the Christianity is growing, Jerusalem is completely de-judified that town. is so fascinating like it makes you wonder it makes me think a lot i don't know it's that's it's really crazy to think about that like like you just said exactly the time of christianity and gnosticism both of them both the two schools of thoughts you know you got the ebionites over on one side the the torah followers and then the gnostics on the other side and you know marcion and and the proto orthodoxies in the middle, I guess you would call them. But like, right when those groups are taking off, Ju Ju Judaism is falling apart and almost becoming extinct. Makes you wonder, like, if that's what kept it alive. I'm not. I don't know. What do you think about that? Not extinct. It just moved to different areas. Mainly the Galilee area is where the the Mishnah and and other famous Jewish texts were were written. And the Jewish diaspora. Um, so the presence of Jews in Rome became much more important than the presence of Jews in in Jerusalem itself. Wow. Um, and, and one slight correction there, because it's often said, and you know, apologists, both in ancient times and today, they want to portray orthodoxy, or sometimes called proto-orthodoxy but if you think about it proto-orthodoxy doesn't make a lot of sense because it's just an anachronistic label it's like me calling john wesley a proto-methodist when he never knew what a methodist was um I mean, yeah you're right yeah he was always an anglican um yeah. and he died an anglican so it makes no sense to call him a proto-methodist but it's a uh, hindsight thing it's like the guys that are, are gonna be the pro the orthodoxies i guess you would say but yeah it's still doesn't yeah it, it's like a it's an it's an anachronism, maybe a creative one. I, I think it originates with Bart Ehrman, but it doesn't make it doesn't make a oh, lot of. I heard that from actually. You're right. That's exactly where I heard that from. It doesn't make a lot of historical sense. So, what to call these people? Um, I think maybe um, incipient Catholics might be slightly more accurate. Um, that is, people who are moving toward what we would call um, 
the early Catholic Church, which is worlds apart from the modern Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. So you should keep that in mind. Um, but these people, apologists like Justin Martyr and Tatian and Theophilus of Antioch, they all want to portray themselves as the center with Marcion somewhere far out in the extreme and with Jewish believers of Jesus far out on another extreme. And yeah. you have to realize that's an apologetic argument. It's called the golden mean argument. It's sort of like saying, well, I'm in a good place. I'm in the middle and you guys are over here. And then you go, other guys are over here and I'm in the middle. So I'm in the good place. I'm in the sweet spot. I'm in the golden mean. More like a triangle. They're all More in the triangle. triangle. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're all and, in the and historically, that just makes no sense at all. Um, these people were all over the map, sort of like a, a scatter shot. But and and they're viewing things with different values and different frameworks than we have. So, yeah, a, a Jewish believer in Jesus who accepts the Mosaic Law is not going to say that they're on a, that they're an extreme, right? Uh, likewise, Marcin isn't going to say that I'm on that I'm extreme because. I don't think the Judean deity is the true true deity. And you would Mar never say that. <laughs> if Marcion did, when if his idea of Christianity did become the Orthodox, they would th they was they would have said Paul was extreme. They would have said this guy Paul he was he was all the way out there, and who knows what he wanted? He wanted to sell the church his version of Christianity. He failed. That's what they would have been saying. It would have been the same. He just would have been replaced with Marcion, just as a different, you know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, I mean, this is useful to do. I mean. It, it's the historical imagination. Imagine for a second if Marcion's movement became the dominant movement and then received the state funding under Constantine. And and what what would we look? What would we be talking about today? Well, we'd be talking about how stupid the early Catholics were for worshiping a demon instead of instead of the true God of Jesus Christ. <laughs> You're right. That's what that's what we that's what would be talked about in churches today. But instead, history has played out a different way and what early what christians today talk about is how bad marcin was for rejecting the old testament which is a whole bunch of bunk and is is really not a, a very accurate way of viewing things <laughs> right, right. so, so the, one of the greatest things that, that i think i would urge everyone to do is just know your history and know it really really well and be very careful about accepting dominant narratives that say, you know, somebody is on the far right or the far left, or somebody's an extremist, um, and therefore they lost. Um, all of that, I think, is really not very, not very historical. What you need to kind of imagine is taking a time machine back into the mid-second century where there was no orthodoxy and no one knew who was going to be the dominant faction. And, you know, and just imagine yourself in that period and go from there and and try to think in categories that don't already sort of anachronistically uh say who's the winner and loser that's another problem with proto-orthodox it, it's sort of like saying the proto winners and that's a really anachronistic oh, way of of, yeah. of thinking um because i mean let's face it even if uh, even if a certain branch of Christianity became dominant, they did so by adapting and adopting and through osmosis, many, many different ideas. And among those were, were Marcionite ideas because Marcion yeah. also was a good scholar. He did good scholarship on the Hebrew Bible. He was an ascetic. And some of those ascetic things that Marcion practiced became orthodox in the monastic movement yeah so it, we're not talking about black and white we're we're talking about lots and lots of gray no and that's a good point that you bring that up because it, in the new testament canon itself there's a lot of gnostic uh themes that arise like in john for example what we were talking about earlier with the your fathers of the devil uh or even like books of revelation it just it has a very gnostic feel to it if that makes sense and it's like you said, the the, uh, the Orthodox itself has traits of all of these groups of Christians. 
sort of making their way into the canon, which is which would make sense for it to grow that way. Sure. A lot of these people, and one of the major points of the Evil Creator book is that Marcion was a very good reader of the New Testament. Now his, and the Hebrew Bible. And so, you know, the point is that because of Orthodox tradition, traditions today, it's almost impossible to think like Marcion. And you have to, you have to really try hard to set aside your evangelical upbringing and what you were told the Bible said, because it's all a bunch of garbage as far as Marcion is concerned. And just sort of start afresh as if you knew nothing. And then understand the text as Marcion did. And that takes a lot of effort because his, his interpretations might seem very strange to you at first. But the point is that in his time, there were no traditions. You know, there wasn't a, a 1900 year track record that of things that you learned in Sunday school determining how you read the Bible. No, there, there wasn't that because it was all being invented and it was okay. all... It's all it, fresh. It, it was all fresh, exactly. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, yeah, uh, the book, The Evil Creator. I'm showing it right now on the screen as we uh, as I'm showing this, and um, go out and get it. And is there anything else you want to say about where they can find it, or any other closing comments on the book that, without giving too much away? No, I, I mean, I, I. I have it here. Um, it's it's reached me even in Australia. It is an academic book with an academic yeah. press, and so I, I apologize that academic publishers initially they charge a high price. So I do apologize for that. Um, I would encourage people to yeah look at the e versions, and as used copies become available, uh, hopefully we'll get that price driven down. You can also simply ask your local library, if you have a, a university library in town, to purchase the book for you. That's what the publisher wants. Um, even if you have just a local public library and you can make a purchase request. Typically, I found that libraries will just go ahead and, and purchase what is requested. And that's a great way to get uh, basically a free book. Wow, I didn't know that. That's a good, that's good information. Hopefully, people to go and do that. And, but regardless the prices, it's what it is. You're getting what you're getting because it's so much in there. There's so much good information in there that you're not gonna find looking, just going on Google and Wikipedia. Like this is deep scholarship. This is really good information. It was worth it for me. So, I mean, if you got it, I would just buy it anyway. But that is also a good good way to go do it. If you don't, you can't afford it, go to your library and there you go. And, um. And it's if you you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.